Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core, and this is the Mio Mini. You've probably heard of it. This little device became so popular last year that they basically ran out of screens to make more. And so as a result, the Mio Mini is no longer being produced. The only place to find this is on eBay for really high prices. And it's kind of a shame because this is one of my favorite handhelds to be released last year. Well, thankfully all is not lost because Mio has now released a new device. They're calling this one the Mio Mini Plus. In addition to being a little bit bigger than the Mio Mini, this one also is using a common 3.5 inch screen size, which means that we hopefully won't run out of supply halfway through the year. Now in terms of hardware, the internals here are exactly the same as before, so it's going to be able to play all of your typical 8-bit, 16-bit systems as you see here. Essentially, it's going to be able to play all the way up to the PS1. The only other hardware difference between the original Mio Mini and this one here is that this one ships with a Wi-Fi chip inside. And this might bring some interesting functionality in the future, for example, the ability to play online with your friends or be able to get retro achievements as well. And so in this video here, we're mostly going to focus on the hardware differences between the Mio Mini and the Mio Mini Plus. Specifically, I want to talk about how it feels in the hands and some of the improvements they've made along the way. Additionally, we're going to take a look at the stock operating system that ships with the device and then also a preview of Onion OS. The team has been working on an upgraded version of Onion OS for some time now, and so they're hoping to release it the same time that the Mio Mini Plus ships in March. And additionally, we'll take a look at some of the differences between the Mini Mini Plus and the Ambernic RG35XX since they are so similar at this point. But as far as a deep dive comparison between the two, I'll leave that for a future video. For now, we're really going to focus on the Mio Mini Plus and see whether or not it's going to be worth your initial investment. And so without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, to start, my review unit actually came from this website here, KeepRetro.com. Now, KeepRetro is a reseller, which means that they buy a bunch of devices in bulk and then sell them out to people individually. One of the benefits here is that they offer pre-orders before a device launches, and so if you don't want to go to the Miu website on AliExpress and wait for stock to actually fill up, you can make a pre-order with KeepRetro and then they'll ship it when it's available. I'm going to jump in here real quick just to say that the pre-order listing on KeepRetro.com is now live, so I'll have it linked in the video description below. It is $68 right now, and that includes free shipping. It's up to you whether or not you want to wait for Miu to actually release theirs, which should be in early March. You'll probably save a couple dollars that way. Really, when it comes down to the pre-order, it's all about that peace of mind, whether or not you'd like to order it and then just kind of wait for it to arrive, or if you want to play that whole Miu game where you try to order it before the stock runs out. I'm not sure if the stock's going to run out, but either way, that's just what's available, and so I'll have it linked below. Now, the Miu Mini came in four different colors, retro gray, white, transparent black, and transparent blue. But I've been told that for the Miu Mini Plus, the transparent blue has been swapped out for a transparent purple instead. Also bear in mind that because mine is an early review unit, there may be some changes in the future. But as it stands right now, the product as I got it seemed to be in pretty much final shape. It looks like the Mio Mini Plus is going to be coming in a box instead of a soft shell case, which is kind of a bummer because I really like those original cases. Inside the box, we're going to get a USB card reader as well as a charging cable and then a screen protector as well. Now looking at the device itself, first impression here is that it's surprisingly thick. In fact, at the bottom here, it's about 22 millimeters or 9 tenths of an inch, and it definitely feels quite chunky in the hands. Another thing of note is that it is quite blocky. In fact, it's less rounded around the edges than I expected. It definitely gives me a late 80s vibe and reminds me a lot of the original Game Boy. And so yes, I do think the chunky and thick quality of the Mio Mini Plus will throw off a couple original Mio Mini owners. Now that said, it's only about 15% thicker, but feels a lot more than that. Another thing I observed about the Mio Mini Plus is that it lays down flat on the table. Most of the other vertical handhelds have protruding shoulder buttons on the back. And so for me personally, I love the fact that it doesn't have protruding shoulder buttons. It's going to make it easier to find a nice form-fitting case for the device, and it also is going to be more pocket-friendly as well. So let's go ahead and take a closer look at the shoulder buttons here. From a design standpoint, you can see that the trigger buttons, the L2 and R2 buttons, are now a little bit higher than the shoulder ones. And I find that this orientation actually makes it a lot more comfortable than the original Mio Mini. When holding the Mio Mini Plus, you can now touch the trigger buttons with the tips of your fingers, and then also press the shoulder buttons with the meat, and there's no conflict there. Another thing that surprised me is that the device does not really rattle when you shake it. Let's take a listen here. In fact, in terms of rattling, I think this might be the quietest vertical handheld I've tried to date. Now, in terms of just holding the device and overall ergonomics, this also feels much improved over the original. Part of that has to do with the larger size. For example, my index fingers will comfortably rest over the shoulder and trigger buttons. And the overall thickness of the device does give it a more solid grip to it as well. 
I know a lot of people were concerned about having the button so low on the device, but I would say that having your index fingers over the shoulder and trigger buttons right here actually balances things really well. And so for me, at least over the past couple weeks of testing this device, I've never felt like the D-pad or the face buttons were too low. Now let's talk about the feel of the buttons themselves. If you've ever used an original Miu Mini, this is almost identical. The D-pad uses a rubber membrane connection and has a good amount of travel and pivot to it. And because they use a bit of a softer rubber membrane, that means it's going to be very light on the fingers. It's very easy to press down on this D-pad, but still feels pretty accurate. As far as accuracy goes, I found that false diagonals, one of the chief complaints when it comes to a D-pad here with retro gaming, is actually fairly minimal. As an example, we're going to play Contra here, and I'm going to press down on the D-pad and then try to wiggle it back and forth and see if my character moves. And as you can see, the character does move somewhat here and there if I press it to the very edges, but it's really not that bad. As a quick comparison, here is the Ambernic RG35XX, which has a known problem of having these false diagonals. Here you can see that when pressing down on the D-pad, I can basically just still move my guy left and right. And so while this isn't going to be a comparison video specifically between these two, I would say that in terms of D-pad diagonals, the Mio Mini Plus is way more accurate. Now moving over to the face buttons, these also have a rubber membrane connection and are identical to the original Mio Mini. These also use a softer rubber membrane pad, which means that they're going to be very light to the touch. And this is something I really like about the face buttons, because it means you can press down on them very easily and quickly. Also on the front, we have a select and start and menu button, and each of these have a rubber membrane connection as well, but a little bit clickier than the others. Additionally, on the bottom right, we have a single mono speaker. Looking at the bottom, we have a USB-C port for charging, then the SD card slot for your games, as well as a headphone jack. On the left, we no longer have a volume wheel, but actual volume plus and minus buttons. I always prefer a wheel, but these aren't terrible. Up top, we have a power button as well as an LED indicator when the device is charging or on. And then finally, nothing on the right side. Now looking at the back here, the first thing you may notice is a much larger battery. This one is actually 3000 milliamp hours or 50% bigger than the original Mio Minis. I found that on average, I've gotten between six and eight hours of battery life here. Now, like with the original Mio Mini, there is a back plate here to allow you to access the battery, but I will say that the back plate here on the Mio Mini Plus is much more sturdy than the original. In fact, it is actually quite hard to open up the shell itself, which I think is a good thing. And so in a nutshell, when it comes to hardware, I do think the Mio Mini Plus is an improvement in almost every single way over the original. But of course, all these improvements do come with a concession in the fact that the Mio Mini Plus is quite a bit bigger than the original Mio Mini. As you can see here with the size comparison, it is quite a bit of a jump. Additionally, the Mio Mini Plus is about 35% heavier than the original. I would say it's about the same width as the original RG280V, but quite a bit taller as well. And that added height does make it more comfortable too. Now in comparison to the Ambernic RG35XX, you can see the Ambernic device is quite a bit taller. And I'll do a more comprehensive breakdown when I do my comparison video between the two, but I will say they're both very comfortable handhelds, and it's very hard for me to distinguish if I like one better than the other. Moving over to bigger devices, here's the Ambernic RG353V. Now this one is quite a bit more powerful and more expensive, and also has those two analog sticks which make it taller as well. And finally, the last comparison when it comes to emulation devices is the Ambernic RG351V. This one's the largest among all of them, and as you can see, it kind of dwarfs the Mio Mini Plus. For a comparison with original hardware, here is the Game Boy Color, and then also an updated version of the original Game Boy with a new shell. And so it is quite a bit smaller than those devices too. Next, I'm going to enlist the help of my wife here to be able to start all these games at the same time, because I want to give you a comparison here with the differences between each of these screens. And with the exception of the original Mio Mini on the far right, each of these other devices have a 3.5 inch screen with a 4x3 aspect ratio and the same 480p resolution. But as you can see, there is some variation between color temperature and saturation between these devices. And personally, among all of them, I still think I prefer the Ambernic RG351V the most. I like the fact that it has a little bit more of a red tint to it and also has some deeper blacks. However, one of the things I really like about the Miu Mini software is the ability to actually adjust the color profile. And I'll show that off a little bit when we get to the software section here later. But in conclusion, when looking at these different screens here, I would say the Miu Mini Plus just naturally has a very nice screen. And it also has a bit of an advantage in the fact that you can adjust the color temperature and saturation within the settings, unlike the others. Now, another thing I really liked about the original Miu Mini is that the overall size lent itself very well to be able to play it one handed. And I think that worked out really well when playing role playing games like Final Fantasy Tactics. Now, for me personally, I think that the Miu Mini Plus is a little bit too large to be able to play it comfortably one handed like this. I found that it's 
just too much of a stretch to actually reach the face buttons. And I would say it's the exact same experience with the Ambernic RG35XX as well. And so when it comes to one-handed gaming, I don't think either of these devices are going to be a great fit. Now another complaint among many people is that while the Miu Mini was very cute and very easy to pocket, it also was a bit of a compromised experience when actually playing games because it was so small. I would say it was a great experience all the way from 20 to 30 minutes, but anything after that felt a little bit cramped. By comparison, I found that the Miu Mini Plus was a much roomier experience. It's definitely not going to be as comfortable as something like a horizontal form factor device or something with a larger size, but all the same, I never really had any complaints about the overall size when playing for longer sessions. And additionally, the 3.5 inch screen does make it a lot easier on the eyes as well. And so I would say for longer gaming sessions, the Miu Mini Plus feels a lot more comfortable than the original. Another thing I like to test when it comes to screens is how dim it will get in the dark. And so turning off the studio lights here, you can see it is rather bright at full brightness. But if you go into the settings, you can drop it down all the way to 1 out of 10. I would say this screen is going to be a little bit too bright for very dark conditions, but it still has a pretty good dynamic range. Another thing to bear in mind is that the transparent models will be quite bright at the top by virtue of having this LED light. So next, let's move over to the software experience. We're going to start with the stock operating system that comes with the device. And this setup looks identical to the original Mew Mini. And so here you can browse through the original game systems as well as the RetroArch cores to load up however you'd like. Additionally, within the apps, there's a collection of ports and homebrew games too. And within the settings, you can see there is now a Wi-Fi function. And I was able to use this to connect to my home Wi-Fi. Additionally, I did want to show off that color option, which I mentioned before, which allows you to adjust some of the parameters of the screen if you want to tailor it to your own tastes. For the most part, you're probably going to spend most of your time in the game section. This is where you're going to choose your system and then load up your game. And my device came with a 64 gigabyte card that was preloaded with a bunch of games. So let's go ahead and test out a few of these and see how they feel. We're going to start with Game Boy Advance. And one of the things I noticed here is they have a Miu overlay. And this is actually kind of neat. They have a Miu logo here on the top left and then a Game Boy Advance logo on the bottom. And this is scaled correctly to a 3 by 2 aspect ratio. While we're in here, let's go ahead and do a quick audio test. In my assessment, I would say that the sound quality here is about the same as it was on the original Mio Mini. And that is that it can get quite loud, but it is very distorted when you get to those higher volumes. So from an audio perspective, I would say this is not going to win any awards. Now when trying out other systems, you may find a hiccup here and there. For example, with Game Boy, there are no colorization options, and so you will have to play the games in black and white. Same thing with NES, they have this overlay here, and then also squish it down to an 8x7 aspect ratio. And so on the stock operating system, I would say that some of these configurations are not ideal, at least for me. When you're done playing a game, you can press the center function button to bring up a menu. And this has options like the ability to save a save state and load it. And then you can also go into what they call the native menu. For most systems, this will just go into RetroArch. Additionally, there is a net play function here in the stock operating system, which brings up the RetroArch net play menu. And for me, at least right now, I wasn't able to get the net play to actually work. Additionally, within the menu, you can also quit out your game. And so really, that's about it when it comes to the stock operating system experience. It's a very simple setup, and I'd say one of the biggest advantages of getting that SD card that comes with the device is the fact that it does come preloaded with a bunch of games. Now, I'm always an advocate for using your own ROM library as opposed to one that comes preloaded with a system, but I will say that with the exception to the NES games, almost every single one of these other collections are very comprehensive. And so you didn't hear this from me, but you could potentially pull the games off this device using the USB reader that comes with it, and then use those same games for a different operating system, which is actually the topic of our next segment. As I mentioned in the intro, the Onion team has been working on an upgraded version of Onion OS, and they're hoping to release it around the same time that the device itself launches. Now thankfully they actually sent me a preview build of it so I can show it off here in this video, but as you can see right now it's basically identical to the Onion experience that's available on the Mio Mini as well. And really at first glance, the Onion experience does kind of look a lot like the stock firmware, but really all the work has been done under the hood. For example, they have updated and optimized most of the emulators, and they've also pre-configured most of the settings. So for example, with the original Game Boy, you can see here it has a nice green colorization. And then other systems like Game Boy Color and Game Boy Advance are all scaling properly as well. 
And so if you do end up picking up the Miu Mini Plus, I would strongly recommend checking out Onion OS when you have the chance. It's going to have a lot of nice optimizations under the hood to really enhance the experience, and I've done several videos about Onion in the past. In terms of performance, I would expect to be able to play everything up through the 16-bit era absolutely no problem. So that means everything from like the original Game Boy all the way up through Super Nintendo are going to play great. Additionally, you have quite a few options when it comes to arcade cores, so if you want to play some original arcade games like Bucky O'Hare like this, yeah, absolutely no problem here. The only system that still has a little bit of hit and miss is going to be PlayStation 1. The vast majority of the games are going to play at full speed absolutely no problem, but those at that very high tier like the top 1%, Tekken 3 or Bloody Roar 2, these games are still going to have a bit of slowdown here and there. So not every PS1 game is going to play perfectly, but many of them do, and I think for everything below that, they're all going to play just fine. Okay, I think we've gotten a good idea of the look and feel of the device at this point now, so let's talk about what I like and what I don't like about it. To start, I like the larger screen on the Mio Mini Plus. I think 3.5 inches on a small device like this looks very impressive. If you ever thought the screen of the Mio Mini was just a little bit too small, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised here. Now for me, I was most surprised by the sturdy design of the Mio Mini Plus. I always felt that the original Mio Mini was a very fragile device. I always felt like it needed to be in a case at all times. And if you go onto Reddit, you'll see many reports of people who have dropped their device and that the screen either pops out or breaks altogether. And to me, it seems like they've made quite a few improvements in that regard. Number one is the backplate. It feels very sturdy, but then also this screen feels more solid too. I also like the improved battery life on the Mio Mini Plus. I got anywhere from six to eight hours almost every single time. Now the buttons and D-pad really didn't change at all. And I think that's a good thing because why mess with it if it's not broke? And so in this case, I do think that the overall feel is very good. I'm also excited to see that Onion OS is going to be ready to launch about the same time as the Mio Mini releases in March. In the end, I think it's kind of amazing that we have such a mature custom firmware available on day one. That means we'll be able to take advantage of some of my favorite features of Onion, like the game switcher function from day one. And finally, I'm very thankful that they added Wi-Fi to this device. For years now, I've been hoping to get a very small device that has a Wi-Fi capability. Personally, I'm a fan of earning retro achievements, and so the idea of being able to do this on a very small device like this is pretty awesome. And so I'm hoping that we'll see some of these functionalities coming here in the near future. Now, of course, no device is perfect, and so let's talk about some of the things I don't like about the Mio Mini Plus. And to be honest, most of these are kind of nitpicky or very speculative. To start, I think overall, if you're expecting to have that same small, cute feel of the Mio Mini, this isn't really going to provide that same benefit. The Mio Mini itself had a wow factor that people just love this thing for being so small but being able to do so much. And while I do think that the Mio Mini Plus is a very impressive machine, I would not call it Mini anymore. If anything, I would have preferred that the company called this the Mio Medium instead. And I don't really think that's a bad thing, but if you were specifically drawn to the small form factor of the Mio Mini, you might be a little bit disappointed in the overall larger size here of the Mio Mini Plus. Additionally, I'm a little bit bummed out in the fact that the device does not come with its own carrying case. That was one of the nicer perks of getting the Mio Mini, in the fact that you didn't have to buy a case right away. Now, I suspect this device is also going to be very popular, and so because of that, we will have many case options coming out from the community. But as it stands right now, it would have been nice to be able to have that when buying the device. And finally, despite what I've heard from Miu themselves, I'm still a little bit worried about supply issues overall with the Miu Mini Plus. For anyone who was following the Miu Mini saga that happened over the past year, it was kind of frustrating to not be able to buy the device when you want. And I think the lack of supply here has actually increased the demand even more, and so my worry here is that Miu again will not be able to keep up with the demand. Now I'd love to be proven wrong about this, but as it stands right now, I'm not going to be surprised if this thing does go out of stock. And so in conclusion, I do think the Miu Mini Plus is a very nice handheld. At a price between $65 and $75, you're getting a lot of bang for your buck. And I'm especially interested to see how the whole Wi-Fi thing plays out with it down the line. Now probably the main question I've been getting mostly is whether or not someone should buy the Miu Mini Plus or the Amernic RG35XX. And like I mentioned, I am going to make a separate video that's a deep dive comparison between the two. But as a preview here, as it stands right now, I think that both of these are very good value for the price. They're both comfortable handhelds that have custom operating system options and can also play up to PS1 pretty reliably. Additionally, they are priced very similarly as well. And so if anything, I would say there's no reason to feel FOMO between one or the other. If you already own the 35XX, then I think the Mio Mini Plus really isn't going to be necessary unless you really want Wi-Fi or you're a collector. 
And alternatively, if you are gonna pick up the Mew Mini Plus, then you're not gonna miss out on much with the 35XX, unless you really wanna have the real-time clock, the HDMI out functionality, and the faster processor, which can handle every PS1 game. Either way, be on the lookout for that comparison video, because I'll go really into depth between the two then, but as it stands, these are both great choices. At the end of the day, for all intents and purposes, the Mew Mini era is now over. Unless we're able to source more screens, I just don't see this one being offered in the future. And so it really comes down to whether or not you're comfortable with the larger size of the Mew Mini Plus, which also happens to come with a number of different improvements that make it a very worthwhile successor. From my perspective, as someone who's owned many Mew Mini devices over the past year, I can comfortably say that I've moved on from the Mew Mini to the Mew Mini Plus. I like that it's more comfortable and has a larger screen, and I also love the fact that it feels more sturdy as well. So yes, for me personally, I think the Mew Mini Plus is a great recommendation, especially at this price point. And so if you're interested in picking one up, I'll leave a link in the video description below. As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.